were calling Central City Hospital and, um, you know, talking to the doctors, and they were saying, you know, we really think he's practically brain dead, and we're going to have him committed to an insane asylum. I finally got out, and I was coming back. I uh, had a girlfriend pick me up to drive me back to Taos, New Mexico. On the way there, I told her that I was going to kill myself as soon as we got back because I would never be able to act again, and that was my life, and uh, I would never be able to work again because I couldn't gesture, I couldn't talk, I couldn't speak. She got me on an airplane, flew me back to see my doctor, and my private doctor, he looked at me and said, my God, they didn't give you enough cogentin. He shot me up 20 times with this stuff. Uh, and he said, I think that ought to do it. I got off the bed. I, I put my pants on. And, and he said, how do you feel? And I said, and I put my hand in my back pocket. And I said, my God, look what I just, and my, this hand raised. And I went, and I spoke a sentence. And I said, it's a miracle. And he said, no, it's not a miracle. They didn't give you enough of this drug. When he came back, uh, I didn't even really recognize him. His, he, his, his face had contorted. He was obviously very disturbed. I never, uh, never drank again, never took a downer, never smoked any grass. And now secretly for a year, and went to meetings saying, I'm an alcoholic. Uh, sometimes I'd get into a narcotics anonymous meeting, and I'd have a half an ounce of cocaine in my pocket. I said, I'm an alcoholic. And now I, I just snorted it, and I never shared with anybody. It's the first time I was ever secretive about anything. And I ended up incarcerated again, the same illusions and all, and all the things that I had the first time. And this time, I was really lucky to have gotten out at all. He will survive anything. I think he does have nine lives. It's almost supernatural. He should have been dead a long time ago. I thought it was going to take a lot longer than it did. I visited him at the hospital and took walks with him uh, on the beach. Uh, during that period, we'd go to a little coffee place down the Venice uh, walkway. I can't say I was 100% confident that it would work out all right all the time, but I always believed in his, his strength that somehow you pull out of it. Venice has always cared about life. He didn't perhaps care about the method of his life, but he's always cared about life. He's always cared about what he wanted to do, and he's always wanted to do something that was creative. I guess he felt that he hadn't done all he wanted to do yet. There was no chance in the world that he would not come out of it. The thing that has always saved me, and the only thing I ever really had was, was like, as an actor, was my, was the role and my performance and how much I cared about that and how much I really love acting. Dennis called me up one day and introduced himself, and he said, David, uh, I have to play Frank Booth because I am Frank Booth. And, uh... Like, I kind of, like, uh, thought about that for a few seconds as an, and sort of, you know, uh, was shaking a hair and uh, knew I had the guy. Mommy. Oh, Mommy. I'd heard the stories, I think, like everybody else, that he was a madman and that the drugs and, you know, and everything had really turned him into something insane. Uh, but I'd also heard before starting the show that he had cleaned up, so I, I wasn't sure who I was going to meet. And it's funny, I, and I do remember the first meeting real well. Uh, we were outside the studios down in Wilmington, and I was sitting on a back of a camera truck. And I'd heard he was there that day, so I kind of kept my eyes open for him. Sure enough, he came walking around the corner. He had a red like a red cotton shirt on and a black and white coat. His hair was back gray, you know. And uh, he looked like he, he uh, owned a restaurant or something. I mean, the guy was so put together. I'll send you a love letter. Straight from my heart, fucker! You know what a love letter is? It's a bullet from a fucking gun, fucker. You receive a love letter from me, you're fucked forever. My 
You understand, fuck? I'll send you straight to hell, fucker! I saw this thing coming to life and with unbelievable power. And, um, you know, the, the feeling on the set, you know, was, uh, it was like very, very, very quiet and, and a disturbing, you know, quiet when, you know, we'd finish uh, a take. Dennis just latched onto Frank Booth very well. just astounded me and definitely Dennis and Frank Booth worked out the worst aspects of his alter ego thought that he'd pull through. He was like this, maybe he was like a comic book character in my mind. I think of like Superman. <laughs> You think I'm not fucking crazy? Go ahead, try me. Try me, you fuck. Why don't you just chill out a little bit and figure out which side you're on? I would if I could. I'd like to do a few more acting jobs, which I'm going to do. I'd like to direct another movie, maybe two more movies, in the style that I'm doing them now which is basically other people's work and, and uh, writing. Then I want to, like, write something. I want to make a personal film about the demise and fall and rebirth of Dennis Hopper and make a film about it while I'm still young enough to play that guy. You want to be a bird? 